So on today's show, I have Scott Horton. Scott is the managing director of the Libertarian Institute and the editorial director of antiwar.com. Scott is also the host of Antiwar Radio and the Scott Horton Show. And for anyone who hasn't read Scott's book, Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, do yourself a huge favor uh, and buy that book. It's probably the best book on the war in Afghanistan that is published right now. And that's just not, that's not just my opinion. Um, Scott, thank you so much for joining me. How's it going? Very happy to be here. Thank you, Henry. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is great. And it's an absolute thrill to have you, have you on. And um, it, it's perfect timing as well, because I'm really having a hard time unpacking everything that's been going on in Syria and Afghanistan over the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. With Trump announcing he wants to, I guess, moderately de-escalate the U.S. military presence in the greater Middle East, establishment Republicans and Democrats have effectively lost their mind. I don't know how else to really say it. Um, everyone from Mia Farrow to uh, Lindsey Graham are, uh, are very critical of Mr. Trump. And uh, apparently this is a, a plot from um, Vladimir Putin. And uh, we're now in, empowering uh, Russia, Iran, Assad, Lord Zenu, ISIS, Al Qaeda. Um, mm -hmm. We're empowering every single bad person on earth. And I think right now, I, th I think it might be even as we speak, uh, John Bolton is uh, currently, I think, in Israel with uh, Netanyahu, and he's uh, currently uh, contradicting Trump. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he's saying, but I'm really confused. Um, I really don't know what to make of this anymore. So, uh, Scott, I was hoping that you can give your assessment on this. Sure. Okay. So the whole thing is a big, complicated mess. So, but before we start running down, you know, this ethnicity lives here, and that ethnicity and religious sect is on this side, and that kind of thing. You know, I guess the simplest way to go about it is to explain, as James Mattis put it, that the problem in the Middle East is Iran, Iran, Iran. And essentially, the deal is that the Americans, on the American side, they, one, can't forgive the Iranian people for their revolution in 1979 when they overthrew the American-backed sock puppet dictator and installed their Shiite revolution in its place and declared independence from the American empire. And two, at the fall of the Soviet Union, it was decided that there are really very few enemies in the world to justify any sort of arms buildup. And it was decided by the military and the CIA that Iran was big enough and independent enough and was working on missile technology enough that they could frame a narrative around a possible eventual Iranian threat at least to American assets in the region and that kind of thing. So it serves a purpose as a permanent boogeyman, um, you know, to point at, to justify military spending and that sort of thing. The dangerous rogue states, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea, this kind of thing. And then the Israelis hate Iran. And what's funny about this is that after the revolution, the Shiite revolution in 79, the Israelis really sided with Iran. When Ronald Reagan, starting with Jimmy Carter, but then Ronald Reagan backed Saddam Hussein against Iran in the 1980s in the Iran-Iraq war, the Israelis took Iran's side. They were perfectly happy with the Shiite revolution. In fact, the new government had kind of kept the old security services in place there, and they kept their long-term relationship with the Israelis going. It wasn't until the 1990s, after the Soviet Union fell apart, and the Israelis really needed a new excuse to stay friends with the Americans, to stay allies, to keep the, the Americans on their side. And so they decided simply, and it was actually brilliant if you think about it, um, to embark on this whole new public relations campaign about radical Islam. And so it doesn't matter whether it's left or right or Sunni or Shia or Iraqi or Saudi or Iranian or whatever it is, Pakistani, it's all radical Islam, radical Islam, vague enough, first of all, scary enough sounding, um, right. Sounds like an ideological that can never be reasoned with or placated. And at the same time, vague enough that it could mean anyone the Israelis happen to find themselves in conflict with from Egypt to Syria to, you know, Hezbollah in Lebanon to Iran to Saddam Hussein to whatever they want. And so there, you know, these are the major interests, basically. Right. Revenge an excuse for an enemy, and then also an excuse for the alliance between the Americans and the Israelis. This is really at the core of, you know, the American establishment's enmity with the Iranian government and refusal to accept the Iranian regime uh, as really anything like a legitimate state, 
even 40 years now after their revolution. And so this is really the frame of reference for in the 1980s. Why did Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan back Saddam Hussein? They backed Saddam Hussein because he was containing the Iranian revolution. In fact, he had a very severe interest in doing so. Saddam Hussein was a Sunni and sitting on with a 20% Sunni population, minority rule, dictatorship in the country, he was sitting on a 60% Shiite supermajority. Now, this is all the land from Baghdad down to Kuwait and all the way over east to Iran. This is all Iraqi Shia stand, 60% of the country. So Saddam Hussein was in an emergency in 1980 after the revolution. He was afraid the Shiite revolution was going to spread from Iran into Iraq. And in order to preempt that, he tried to make national sect and Iraqi and ethnic, ethnic sect, Arab, Trump religious sect, Shiite. And so he conscripted all those Iraqi Shiites into his army and he marched them to Tehran or tried to and invaded Iran and started an eight-year war, which really, or nine-year war, which was like World War I in the sense of, you know, trench warfare and battle lines that don't move very far, approximately half a million killed on each side. And as I was saying, the Israelis continued to back the Iranians while the Americans backed Saddam Hussein. Now, it's true, you've heard of Iran-Contra, that Ronald Reagan was also selling missiles to Iran as well. But he was doing that to try to get hostages released from Lebanon rather than a policy of deliberately supporting Iran in war. That was really more of a betrayal of Saddam rather than a deliberate policy to really tilt toward Iran at that point. Um, During that time, America was solidly pro-Saddam Hussein. And after Ronald Reagan left power, and into the George Bush senior years, that was true as well, right? So then, well, I'll skip the whole thing about how we got into Iraq War I, just for time's sake. But let's say it was a dispute over war debts. Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, and Bush Sr., Ronald Reagan's vice president, who had become president, his successor, uh, declared war and launched a war against Iraq in order to drive them. Well, he didn't declare war, but you know what I mean. Launched a war. Um, in order to drive Iraq back out of Kuwait. And this was started in uh, January of 1991, Operation Desert Storm, Iraq War I, to drive Saddam out of Kuwait. Now, here's what's interesting about this that most people don't know, I guess, is that in the aftermath of the war, George Bush Sr. encouraged that Shiite supermajority to rise up and overthrow Saddam Hussein, them and also the Kurds, and we'll hear more about the Kurds in a minute when we get back to Syria. The Kurds in northern Iraq, far northern Iraq, they're another 20%. And they're Sunnis, but they're Kurds, not Arabs. So they're their own separate power and sect. And, and they live up in the mountains. So they have their kind of little Kurdistan. And so the Shiites and the Kurds and the Kurds took George Bush's encouragement, seniors' encouragement, and they rose up against Saddam Hussein. But then the George Bush senior government backstabbed them and betrayed them and turned around, left them high and dry, and let Saddam Hussein keep his attack helicopters and some of his tanks and allowed Saddam to stood there. The Americans occupied the south of the country at the time. And they stood back and watched as Saddam massacred more than 100,000 people in order to suppress the insurrection, particularly in the South, but also up in Kurdistan as well. Um, So this was like the great Bay of Pigs betrayal, right? He set all the people into the middle of a conflict and then stab them in the back and leave them to be massacred. Well, the reason that they did that was because they realized that the Iraqis who had chosen Iran's side in the Iran-Iraq war the ones who had chosen the Shiite revolution in Iran over Iraqi and Arab nationalism, well, they were coming back across the border to lead the new Shiite revolution against Baghdad, namely the Bada Brigade of the Supreme Islamic Council. And at that point, Bush Sr. choked and realized they were importing the Iranian revolution that they, in the Reagan years, had just spent eight years, nine years, supporting Saddam to contain. Now they were reversing that policy. And they said, oh no, we don't want to do that. Oops. And so they called it off. Does that make sense? Am I, am I clear so far? 
No, you're making perfect sense. Okay, good. Okay, so 1990s is the Bill Clinton years. Now, we have the no-fly zones over Iraq in the name of protecting the Shia and the Kurds that we just betrayed. And now, so instead of leaving Saudi Arabia, as Dick Cheney had promised when he was the Secretary of Defense under Bush Sr., had promised King Fahd of Saudi Arabia, we will leave as soon as the war is over. They had already had some bases there anyway, but they did not leave. Now they had a new reason to stay in order to protect these Shiites that they just stabbed in the back supposedly, and to enforce the blockade, which these same people they were protecting, they also had a blockade, which their stated purpose under the Bush senior government and under the Bill Clinton government was to starve the Iraqi people to a point of such desperation that they will rise up and overthrow Saddam for us. Even though we just told them to do that and they had their one chance at it and then we turned around and stabbed them in the back and let Saddam massacre them all. So now that it's absolutely impossible and absurd to think that they could try it again to overthrow Saddam, now we're going to starve them. So now they'll be even weaker in relative power to their central government. But then the theory, if you ask Madeleine Albright, is that we'll make these people so desperate that they will do anything not to attack us or do anything to us who are punishing them, but to get rid of Saddam Hussein, whose fault this is that we're doing this to them. There's a completely absurd excuse for a policy of just keeping a complete lockdown on Iraq through the 1990s. And this also, of course, is about Iran. Because even though the Cold War is over, the mean old Ayatollah from the 1980s, uh, 1979 and 1980s, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, he was dead. He died in, in, I think, 88 or 89. And now you had the new, more moderate Ayatollah Khamenei, who is, you know, at least not the old, scary guy that, you know, called us the great Satan and caused such trouble. And so it's this whole new era, and we ought to be able to open up relations with Iran. They have the new so-called moderate presidents, Katami and Rafsanjani, who are trying to, who are Western educated and trying to open up to the West. But no, no, no. The Israeli partisans in the American government, namely Martin Indyk, came up with this policy called dual containment. We have to stay in Saudi, not just to back, uh, not just to bomb and blockade and contain Iran, Iraq, but also to contain Iran as well. So instead of doing you know, offshore balancing or something where we support these guys against each other, or maybe non-intervention where we don't support any dictators or wars at all. Uh, instead, now we have to have containment of both of these enemy states of each other from the third state of Saudi. Now, this then becomes the major motivation for Osama bin Laden, who takes a group of Amer American-backed, formerly American-backed Arab Mujahideen, who Ronald Reagan's government had sent to fight in Afghanistan in cooperation with the Saudis and the Pakistanis in what was called Operation Cyclone in the 1980s to bog down the Soviet Union in what the American strategists, starting in the Jimmy Carter administration, called their own Vietnam. We'll bog them down in a Vietnam-like quagmire. We just did this to ourselves. Vietnam was shorthand for a really stupid war you shouldn't have done that caused a lot of trouble and disrupted society back home and broke the bank and all these horrible things that Vietnam had done to America, never mind what it did to the people of Vietnam. And they said, well, if the American people have Vietnam syndrome, which means now they're reluctant to engage in any more of these proxy wars, well, maybe we'll try to give a case of the Vietnam syndrome to the Soviets. Maybe instead of containing them, we'll bait them into overexpansion and we'll bog them down and bleed them to bankruptcy. And so that was what America helped the Mujahideen to do under Ronald Reagan, starting with Jimmy Carter and again, continued under Reagan in the 1980s. Well, in the 1990s, these same guys turned on us, not the Afghans, but the Arabs who had gone to fight, led by the predominantly Saudi group, the Azam group, and the predominantly Egyptian group, Islamic Jihad, they joined together Bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri to form Al-Qaeda. And these were the guys who attacked us, really starting with the assassination of a rabbi in New York in 1990. And then, of course, the first World Trade Center bombing. And then a few different attacks and attempted attacks across the Middle East 
um, the National Guard uh, training facility in 1995 in Saudi, to Kobar Towers attack that killed 19 American airmen stationed in Saudi, which the American government, guess who John Brennan was the CIA station chief in Saudi at the time. The FBI knew the truth and wanted to blame it on Osama. And William Perry, the Secretary of Defense, knew the truth and wanted to blame it on Osama. But the FBI, I mean, pardon me, the uh, CIA were determined to go along with the Saudis and blame it on Iran. So now, instead of right-wing religious Saudi nationalists, these Sunni radicals have bombed our airmen and killed our airmen at their barracks in an attempt to drive us off their holy peninsula. Instead of that very clear narrative, instead we were shoveled a bunch of garbage about the Iranians did it. Well, why would the Iranians bomb American airmen stationed in Saudi bombing Iraq? Well, they wouldn't, right? And so it didn't make any sense. Well, it was just a target of opportunity. They were mad about something else from another time, which was you know, really bad, because if they had told the truth about that, there might have been an entirely different discussion inside the United States about just how necessary the American people could really be made to believe these bases in Saudi were, if that was going to be the cost of it. And instead, the whole story got buried. Then you had the Africa embassies attacked in 1998, the USS Cole in the year 2000, and eventually September 11th. And now, if you listen to the Hawks, and you might remember this from back then, even as a young kid at the time, that they said that, see, Al-Qaeda thinks they can scare us away, and that if they just kill a few thousand of us, that America's a paper tiger and we'll turn tail and run like a bunch of Democrats. Well, we're not the Democrats. We're the Republicans now. And now we're not going to be intimidated and cowed and, and bullied and threatened. And so we are, the lesson is we'll never leave anywhere ever again. We're going as many places as we can, and we're going to double, triple, and quadruple down, and no one can ever stop us. And no one is ever going to tell us what we can or cannot do no matter what. When in fact, that was really stupid. Because in fact, they weren't trying to make us leave. They were trying to provoke us into overreacting. Osama bin Laden was attempting to give George Bush and Dick Cheney a crisis to exploit on the presumption that that's exactly what they would do, that they would take full advantage, and that instead of sending a small hit squad to kill bin Laden and his 400 friends in Afghanistan, or God forbid, negotiate with the Taliban over their captivity and treat them under the rule of law as criminals and prosecute them, instead, he would send the army and the Marine Corps, he would occupy Afghanistan, he would bog America down in a crisis, and as Osama bin Laden put it before the attack, numerous times, as well as after, that that was the entire plan, was to trick the Americans into replicating exactly what we had tricked the Soviets into replicating, give them their own Vietnam, give them a no-win quagmire that breaks the bank and eventually, in the case of the Soviet Union, ran their empire all the way into the ground. And I think any honest person will agree, whether you like America's foreign policy or not, that American and Saudi and Pakistani help for the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s in that war really did help destroy the Soviet Union. That really was one of the very final straws that broke the camel's back on that ridiculous communist economic system that they had. And... The whole thing was unraveling anyway, but that was certainly part of it. And, you know, to ask the Reaganites, they gave Ronald Reagan all the credit for being so wise as to do that. And there's plenty of truth in that. But, of course, Osama bin Laden learned the same lesson, that if you just believe in God and you have a trusty AK-47, especially if you have a little help from the CIA, but anyway, you can bog down a superpower and break it. And so that was the purpose of the 9-11 attack. But then now back to the Sunnis and Shias in Iraq for a minute. Bush, of course, exploited Afghanistan, or exploited September 11th, to not only invade Afghanistan and do a regime change there, but then to turn as quickly as possible to go back to Iraq. Now, so here's the thing about Iraq War II, okay? George, George W. Bush, uh, his war, 2003 through 11, okay? Everybody knows it didn't work. Everybody knows it was bad, and a lot of people got killed, and it was a problem. But what happened? Like, what's the point? What, what is there to learn about it, Right other than they lied us into it and that kind of thing. But as far as how the war was conducted, what's important to understand is that George Bush Jr. picked up right where his father had left off when he encouraged but then backstabbed that Shiite revolution, that Shiite and Kurdish revolution uprising against Saddam. 
And George Bush, he didn't know what he was doing, but he was listening to the neocons and they thought they knew what they were doing, but they also didn't know what they were doing. And they believed that by invading Iraq, America would, well, first of all, the new, the, the Shiite supermajority would inherit the power and that America would have dominance over that new Shiite supermajority. And then that would translate into American dominance over Iran and further American dominance in the region and particularly somehow uh, by some alchemy will help America split Iran from Syria or really Syria from Iran is, is more like it. Now this is completely crazy and stupid. This makes no sense at all. Um, if, if what you hate, if you're the neocons and what you hate is the Shiite Iranian alliance of Iran and Damascus, the Assad government in Damascus, Syria, and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, well, getting rid of their worst enemy, Saddam Hussein, for them, doesn't seem like it would make much sense, does it? But they thought that if they got rid of Saddam, they would replace him essentially with a compliant government that would go along with whatever America wished and that, never mind the Iraqi people, they wouldn't have any say or any thoughts or actions of their own. They would do whatever their new rulers made them do and that the Americans would be dominant and it would all be easy. It would all just be fine. But then in fact, that's not the way it played out. They did put the Shiite supermajority in power, but to do so, they helped them fight a civil war that got a million people killed. And when they did that, the Sunnis, who had been dominant in the minority Saddam Hussein bought this government, they had everything to lose by losing the capital city and control over the national government because all the oil is in the north and in the south and out of their hands. It's where the Kurds live and where the Shiites live. So in empowering the Shiite side, the Americans pushed the Sunnis right into full-scale insurgency and an alliance with al-Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which had never existed before the war. And in fact, Zarqawi, its leader, didn't even call himself al-Qaeda or declare his loyalty to bin Laden until the end of 04, more than a year and a half into the war. He declared that, okay, by the way, I'm loyal to bin Laden and his goals now, is when he started um, doing that. So here's the point of this is that George Bush and his government in 2006 and seven realized that they really had screwed up, that this was not going the way that they wanted and that they were empowering not just the Shiite supermajority, but a Shiite supermajority that was in bed with Iran. And that same Bada Brigade in Supreme Islamic Council from 1991, they started coming across the border. They were the ones who inherited the government. They were the ones, the Bada Brigade that Donald Rumsfeld used to try to hunt down and kill the leaders of the Sunni insurgency, which just made it worse. And so when they realized just how bad they'd screwed up, that here they did this mostly because they hate Iran, but they can't fight Iran because Iran's just too damn big. So they said, well, we'll hurt Iran by getting rid of Saddam, which was just dumb. So once they'd empowered Iran, then they panicked and they went crawling. I'm getting to the point here, I swear to God. Then they panicked and went crawling on their hands and knees to the king of Saudi Arabia. Dick Cheney himself, it's in the WikiLeaks, went and told the king of Saudi Arabia, we're really sorry. And the king reads him the riot act and says, you dummy, you were supposed to put the next mustache in line, the next Baathist general in line after Saddam in power. And instead, look what you've done. You've created a, a Shiite supermajority government backed by Iran. And now what am I supposed to do? And this goes to the riddle of, why did our allies, the Saudis, back the Sunni-based insurgency against American troops for five years in that war? And it was because we were fighting on Iran's side because George Bush is stupid as hell. That's why. And so, but then here's the worst part of it, is even after the Saudis had, I mean, we had screwed up, the American side had screwed up, but the Saudis straight betrayed us. The Saudis, as I just said, they were backing that Sunni-based insurgency that was suicide bombing American troops in that war. So what does George Bush and Dick Cheney do? They go with their hat in hand and on their knees and beg forgiveness from the Saudi king. What can we do to please you now, your highness? And then the answer is, at that time, it started out with support for jihadist groups, bin Ladenite groups, just the very same kind of guys who had attacked us on 9-11, the very same kind of guys we were fighting in the Sunni insurgency in Iraq War II. The Saudis insist that George Bush start backing them 
Fatah al-Islam in Lebanon, Muslim Brotherhood groups in Syria, and Jandala in Iran that was kidnapping and beheading generals. I mean, that could have caused a war right there. Can you imagine if somebody kidnapped and beheaded a, a group of six or eight or 10 American generals? What the reaction would be? We'd nuke Tehran, right? This is what American-backed terrorists were doing inside Iran under George W. Bush. So before Obama, under George W. Bush, America had already tilted back toward the Saudis and their Al-Qaeda shock troops. They have no real army. They have Al-Qaeda terrorists. And even though they killed 3,000 on 9-11, and even though they killed 4,000 out of the 4,500 guys that of our guys that died in Iraq War II, that is not really Al-Qaeda, but the Sunni-based insurgency that was you know, very much tied with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, killed 4,000 out of the 4,500 Americans that died in Iraq War II, even though that no matter, no matter, that's what the Saudi king wants. And so we start backing them in Lebanon, Syria, and Iran. Then Barack Obama comes in and starts backing them in Libya in the war against Gaddafi. But we'll skip that for now just for time's sake. And but because all importantly, just as Obama is killing Osama, in Pakistan in May, the beginning of May, 2011. Just at that exact moment, he's killing Osama, he's taking Osama's side in Libya and in Syria. And they spent, the operation was called Timber Sycamore, and they spent a billion dollars a year, and Lord knows how much the Saudis and the Qataris and the Turks and the Israelis spent but those were all America's allies in the plot to back Al-Qaeda, suicide bomber, head chopper terrorists, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the Syrian division, Al-Qaeda in Iraq from Iraq War II, the Syrian division was called Jabhat al-Nusra. And the Americans and their allies backed these guys really up until um, six months into Donald Trump's presidency. It was in June or July of 2017 when Trump finally called a halt to this policy of high treason. And I don't say that as like a right-wing partisan who's just like got a bent against Obama and I want to like say the most hyperbolic thing about it. Like I want to say this in the most calm, like textbook manner. He's literally guilty of treason, him and John Brennan, and starting with Hillary Clinton and David Petraeus before them. And now this isn't because Obama is the secret Muslim terrorist born in Kenya. It's because he's Ronald Reagan. He's George W. Bush. He picked up this policy. The policy is called the redirection. And Henry, you know what? After this interview, go and read Seymour Hersh in the New Yorker magazine from 2007, the redirection. And you will be beside yourself. I'm telling you. It's just, you've got to be kidding me as you read it. And then there's preparing the battlefield and a couple of more by him over the next year or so. Um, you know, explaining this policy further, that they decided, oops, we put Iran's best friends in power in Baghdad, so now we need to try to check Iranian power in every other place. And as Obama told Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic in 2012, that's right, Jeffrey Goldberg, if we get rid of Assad in Syria, that will help bring Iran down a peg. So we can't start the war in Iraq all over again and now cleanse the city of Shiites on behalf of the Sunnis. Too late for that. But we can get a consolation prize by taking out Iran's other Arab uh, ally, Syria. And so that's why America backed al-Qaeda in Syria. And then this is what led to the rise of the Islamic State, was because the Islamic State is really just the Iraqi-dominated faction of al-Qaeda in Iraq, which after all was made up of a lot of foreigners, right? Libyans, Egyptians, and Syrians had all come to Iraq to fight in Iraq War II against the Americans. Well, the Iraqi-dominated faction, they decided they didn't, and this is part of the problem of decapitation strikes. What happened? We kill Osama bin Laden, what happens? This guy Baghdadi now feels newly liberated to stop following Ayman al-Zawahiri's orders and do what he wants to do. And so he declares a caliphate. He seizes all of eastern Syria in 2013 and seizes all of western Iraq, predominantly Sunni Iraq, in 2014 and declares the caliphate. At that point, then, Obama launches Iraq War III again on the side of the, Sh of the Shiite militias that we wish we hadn't backed in Iraq War II. 
in order to drive the Islamic State back out of the predominantly Sunni parts of Western Iraq. And that took from the summer of 2014 through Donald Trump really finished it, his government really finished it in October of 2017. So that took three years. And now, so that's why American forces are embedded with the Kurds in Northwest Syria, because after Obama's let's back Al Qaeda in Syria to make up for Bush's mistake in Baghdad policy blew up in his face. The not just the Shiites, but the uh, Syrian Kurds and the Iraqi Kurds were threatened by the Islamic State and were the most reliable fighters against them. And because the Americans really hated the Shiite militias, they wished they hadn't put in power in Iraq War II, they really preferred to back the Kurds. So they put most of their effort into backing the Kurdish Peshmerga groups, they're called in Iraq, and the Kurdish YPG, they're called in Syria. They're basically ex-communists. They're Bookchinists instead of Marxists now. They follow, they're like Noam Chomsky, anarcho-syndicalist. I was about to ask you, is that why he wants, uh, Noam Chomsky uh, said that we should stay in Syria? Yes, although, by the way, I read um, most of those quotes that are going around, like showing, oh, what a horrible guy Chomsky is for saying that, are actually like pretty old and a little bit devoid of context. Because I actually read one the other day where he really is not advocating American forces staying as much as he's advocating, rather than what I would say, which is, pull every soldier out of everywhere tomorrow, and I don't care hell or high water what happens kind of thing. He's saying we should leave responsibly in a way where we negotiate an exit with Assad, Turkey, and Russia to make sure that Turkey does not invade and obliterate the Kurdish forces that we have built up there. So I don't agree with that, but he is saying, he is talking only in the very most short term. He's not saying America should stay there. He's saying America should not leave in an instant in a way where the Turks are going to feel like they have to attack. And I think actually that problem is already solved because as soon as Donald Trump said, oh, no, we're leaving. In other words, hey, you Syrian Kurds can't rely on us anymore. The Turks are our NATO allies. We care more about them than you. What happened? The Syrian Kurds immediately went to Damascus and made a deal with Assad to allow Assad to put the Syrian Arab army back in there. Now, the Americans don't want that because that's embarrassing for them because they want to rid of Assad and they don't want to admit that the solution here to the ISIS problem in eastern Syria, the solution to the Turkish-Kurdish problem in northeastern Syria is to let the Syrian state reestablish its monopoly on force. And then both of those problems are solved. Right now, America is de facto protecting what's left of ISIS in eastern Syria, where only our forces dominate and we won't allow the Syrian army to cross the Euphrates River. So if we get out of the way, the last ISIS fighters are caught between Shiite-dominated Iraq and the Syrian Arab army and their Hezbollah and Iranian allies and Russian air power, and that's the end of them. So just, just it's the perfect time to it. quit. Yeah, just looking at it with a with a bird's eye view. It I'm sorry for telling like, the whole thirty years story there. I hope that was like made sense going through. You know, no, that context is definitely necessary. The main talking point that you hear, or from Obama, is that this is a conflict that tra that goes back a thousand years. The Sunnis and Shiites they hate each other. There's no they, way that we can prevent a conflict between them. There's just so much animosity, and that is just such an old talking point that. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy that you just went on and debunked that effectively um yeah but i mean you're you're totally right about that i mean they've had whatever the status quo since the fall of the ottoman empire you haven't had sunni shia civil wars in iraq in the 20th century it was george w bush that started that war i saw an interesting stat that in iraq in baghdad prior to the iraq war 50 percent of marriages were between sunni and shiite mm -hmm. yep and the, and you know you can see the color-coded maps that show the systematic sectarian cleansing during Iraq War II, when America was on the side of the Shiite militias, uh, per, um, particularly the Bada Brigade of the Supreme Islamic Council, where they just completely cleansed the city of Sunni Arabs. So it's a 90, uh, pardon me, a 85 to 90 percent Shiite city. Only the very far southwest of the city still has, I think, one Sunni neighborhood left. And so, and now this is the thing. This is why there's going to be Middle East wars over there now for the rest of our lifetimes is because there is no force available 
to reverse what George W. Bush has done. I'm not saying that it's objectively wrong for Shiites to have political power or anything like that, but I'm just saying the reality of the ground on the ground is by George Bush moving that line on the map five miles west, what he did was he made it, he created a situation that is absolutely intolerable in the minds of the Sunni kings of the Arabian Peninsula. And so, but they can't do anything about it except fling suicide bombers at it from now on. But they'll never be able, it took the U.S. Army and Marine Corps and, you know, backing those Shiite militias to cleanse that city of Sunni Arabs. And it took them three years to do it. So there is no comparable power available to reverse that. But so this is why you see the Saudis just lashing out and going crazy because George Bush scored this huge own goal for the American Saudi Israeli alliance in the Middle East by empowering Iran in Iraq War II. So whenever you hear anything going on in the news in the Middle East and you wonder what's the, what's the American role in this, it's always America backs the suicide bombers in order, the, the Bin Ladenites, the Al Qaeda guys, the guys who are literally still sworn loyal to Ayman al Zawahiri, America backs them to try to make up for the fact that they put Iran's friends in power in Baghdad in Iraq War II. That's going to be the story of all of this from now on. I thought they were moderate rebels. Yeah. Well, that's sure what they called them. I mean, and it turned out, and we knew this from the very beginning, that moderate rebels just meant the guys who accept the cash and the guns from the CIA and turn them over to the extremists who do the fighting because they don't mind dying. Yeah, you can't moderately chop someone's head off. Not so much. And in fact, you know what? The Northern Storm Brigade of moderate rebels, before John McCain ever went and met with them, they were on camera telling Time Magazine, that's right, we're proud veterans of Iraq War II where we fought with Zarqawi against the Americans. And that's treason right there. And they were the same guys who had kidnapped a bunch of Lebanese uh, Shiite pilgrims and murdered them or sold them. And they were the same guys who eventually, after they met with McCain, they were the ones who kidnapped Stephen Sotloff for, and sold him to ISIS for $20,000 that then turned around and cut his head off. Then you had the al Farouk Brigade. They're very moderate. Um, they want to hold elections. But yeah, also, yeah, that's their commander on video eating the heart of a dead soldier that he'd killed. But, you know, other than the cannibalism, those guys are extremely moderate. And then here's our friends, Nur al Zinki. And, um, you know, they're very moderate fighters when they're not on video laughing as they, be, as they behead a 10-year-old Palestinian boy that they'd kidnapped from a refugee camp there somewhere on the outskirts of Damascus. These are the moderates in America's rainbow coalition over there. And, you know, Obama himself said on video, because, see, he didn't go full scale, right? He could have bombed the place like he did Libya. Right, He carpet bombed Libya for nine months until regime change was done. He did not do that in Syria. He was terrified to do that in Syria. And so whenever he was, but he, what he did do is back Al-Qaeda for five years, but just not so much that they would win, see? So, but when he's defending himself, he says to Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, and you can see the video, it's on the New York Times website, that look, Thomas Friedman, this whole thing about an army of moderates was always a fantasy that wasn't real. You think a bunch of volunteer, what, doctors and farmers and lawyers and teachers and gardeners and friends from your neighborhood are all going to come together and form a militia that can hold off Al-Qaeda, hold off ISIS, the Al-Qaeda split off, Hezbollah, the Syrian Arab army, and, and all comers, and create a new democratic regime there? I mean, no matter how much support we'd given your very favorite group of rebels, that was always a fantasy. That could have never come true. And he's absolutely right when he says that, which, of course, then raises the obvious question. How come he went ahead and armed al-Qaeda for all those years anyway? You know, his own deputy national security advisor, Ben Rhodes, put out a book this year. And what, six months ago or something, he did an interview and promotion of the book where he says, you know what? You're kind of right. It is a bit absurd that we would be supporting groups that are on the terrorist list. And by that, he means Al-Qaeda. Guys who are sworn blood oath loyal to Ayman al-Zawahiri. 
the butcher of New York City. That's not absurd. That's treason. And again, it's not because they're loyal to foreign Muslim jihadist ideology. It's because American imperial prerogatives say that the American government hates Iran and the Shiites more than the Al-Qaeda terrorists that knocked our towers down and killed our guys in Iraq War II. That's why. Iran never did anything to us. Hezbollah never did. You know, the last time Hezbollah killed Americans was in 1983. So I don't have to worry about Iran abducting me at night and uh, holding me captive? Nope. You sure don't. And by the way, you know, in that that Clint Eastwood movie about um, Chris Kyle, the sniper, they made that movie where America is fighting against the evil torturers with the power drills. Well, the real history is that it was America's friends, the Bada Brigade, that were the ones who were torturing Sunnis to death with power drills. Those were the guys that America put in power there. The Bada Brigade, you now know it as the Iraqi army. And yeah, what they do is they put a power drill in a guy's eyeball, in his ear hole, through his shoulder, through his brain. And they were stacking up Sunni corpses like cordwood, 3,000 killed a month, wake up in the morning, oh my God, look at all the dead Sunni bodies all over the capital city. That was the USA torturing people to death with power drills. Not some horrible boogeyman that Chris Kyle was sent to save the Iraqi people from. You know, something that's really interesting is that um, when Trump announced that they, he'd be de-escalating in Syria, um, immediately, it wasn't, just, um, it wasn't just the Kurds who surrendered over to Assad, but there were, there were rebels, I think, near the Idlib province. I think it was near the Idlib province where they immediately surrendered, um, which, which says to me, I think from just like the casual person who, who pays attention to this stuff, or were the U.S. forces there just meat shields? For these rebels, like you can't bomb this area because there's a risk of accidentally killing a, a U.S. soldier. I don't think so because the Idlib province is in the northwest there, and that's where the Al Qaeda forces okay. are, where the scattered remnants of the Islamic State are in the far, pardon me, in the far eastern desert of the country. Now, I actually had heard of some American-backed anti-ISIS Arab forces. I guess you could call them so-called moderates who were essentially guarding the Jordanian border in the southeast of the country that, and this goes to show about the moderates, that as soon as Trump announced we're leaving, they closed up shop and hightailed it to the Idlib province, which is dominated by Al-Qaeda. So these so-called moderates that America was working with there, they would rather cut a deal with Al-Qaeda than cut a deal with Assad. And those were the guys who were in the southeast, got on buses and fled to the northwest. So this is the last major battle remaining in Syria. And right now there's a ceasefire. The Assad government was going to attack, I think, in November, maybe October. But then the, um, the Russians and the Turks cut a deal that basically tried to divide the forces from the incorrigible ones and those who would surrender and be reintegrated either into Turkey, uh, Turkish auxiliary forces or into the Syrian army or something, I guess. Um, but there's still, I don't know how many few thousand left of uh, the Al-Qaeda forces there. And I don't know what's to become of them. I mean, essentially they're cornered. So I guess at some point it'll probably be a matter of Russian air power coming in. Um, but there are a lot of civilians too. So I don't know, uh, you know, how it's going to be. When do you think that, when do you think um, Assad would, would uh, go forth on that offensive over to Idlib to, I guess, to liberate the last part of Syria? I'm not really sure. I mean, I guess it depends on if he has a real case that the Turks can't hold up their end of the bargain of keeping these guys under wraps. You know, I think that was supposed to be the deal. So, but at some point, I think the Russians, the Iranians, I don't know about the Hezbollah guys, but I assume them too. That they don't want to stay there forever. Despite all this narrative that this is why we have to stay is because Iran is there now. Well, Iran is only there to protect Assad from the Al-Qaeda terrorists we hired. So can't really blame them for that. There's no real reason that, to believe that Iran wants to stay there 
indefinitely. And there's no reason to believe that the Russians want to continue to, you know, hemorrhage dollar bills and bombs there indefinitely when, I mean, they want to keep their base there, but they don't want to, you know, keep this war going indefinitely. I think at some point they're going to get impatient to wrap this thing up. And so, but I have no idea, like, what's the timetable on that? And, you know, we saw in this whole thing, this whole problem comes from the leftovers from Ronald Reagan's jihad in the 80s in Afghanistan. Then they created all the terrorist attacks of the 90s and leading to the wars in Iraq, Libya, Syria. Now, oh, well, really, it was Iraq War II. It was the veterans of Iraq War II that then went home to Libya and Syria and started these wars. Well, that led then to Iraq War III and the rise of the Islamic State Caliphate and this whole five, six, you know, uh, what is it now? Uh, Eight-year war uh, for al-Nusra, uh, al-Qaeda forces against Assad there. We don't know how many thousands of these guys there are. But, you know, the ISIS blowback started as early as I think 2013 was the first time that an Islamic State fighter did an attack in Europe. And it was against, I think, a Jewish museum in Brussels. And it was like, man, we told you, what are you doing back in the Al-Qaeda terrorists in Syria? The blowback has already started. And that was in 2013. And there have been thousands of these guys, and including at least a, a couple of hundred of Americans and low thousands, maybe more than 10,000 Europeans of different nationalities have traveled to Syria to fight with Al-Qaeda or with the Islamic State in these wars since 2011. And how many of them are going to go home to Europe and bide their time, not as a, even necessarily a legit quote unquote sleeper cell, but just as an individual sleeper cell and just, you know, sit and wait around until they decide they want to go to war. And now they have some experience and know what it's like. And they've been there, you know, the Manchester attack in England where the guy murdered all the little girls at the, at the pop concert where they were like, all the victims were like 11 year old girls and stuff. That guy was brought by MI6 from England to Libya to fight with Al-Qaeda to overthrow Gaddafi. And then they brought him home again on a Royal Navy ship. That was the terrorist that did that attack. So, you know, we might be looking for, as long as the, the policy of, you know, attempted regional hegemony over there remains, we're going to continue having attacks. There are now thousands of these guys. And I don't trust the police and the intelligence services of the U.S. and Europe to keep tabs on them all and keep them out of our towns, keep them out of our countries. I mean, how could they? In fact, there was that one point where someone asked the FBI in like 2014, hey, are you keeping track of all the guys that the CIA is sending over there to fight against Assad? And the FBI was like, no, why should we? They're the good guys. They're the moderates. It's fine. They, the FBI didn't even know who all was going over to Turkey to, to then go to Syria to fight. So... I'm predicting big problems and, and then continued excuses. And the next time something blows up to, uh, uh, in this country, whether it's tonight or next week, they're going to say, see Islam. Islam makes men into psychopaths who hate freedom and innocence. And they won't ever admit a single word of what I've been ranting at you for the last hour here. Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's the standard. Uh, I mean, I guess that's more like the right wing talking point nowadays. It's uh, radical Islam is going to destroy Western civilization and, our only choice is to back Israel at all costs because they are the one pillar that prevents the wave of radical jihadism to go into Europe and then Trent and then go to, go to America. Isn't um, that funny? Since it actually means nothing at all. Like, what do they really think? That Israel is like blocking the Bosporus Straits, preventing what, you know, Muslims from moving west, like they're minus Tarith, holding back the hordes of, uh, you know, the, of Mordor or something like that. I mean, look at a map. That's not how it is at all. Israel isn't standing between the west and anybody. And if you just look at the history, you know, I did skip this part a bit um, for brevity's sake. But in the 1990s, Al-Qaeda made it clear over and over again that after the bases in Saudi Arabia – their main reason for attacking the United States is our unlimited and unmitigated support for Israel. And not for Israel simply existing, although bin Laden did complain about their simply existing. But what he mostly complained about and what worked as propaganda for al-Qaeda was complaining about American support for Israeli war crimes against Palestinians on the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, as well as Palestinian uh, refugees in Lebanon and Lebanese along with them. And in fact, 
you know, bin Laden's first declaration of war against the United States was published right on the heels of what's now called the first Kana massacre uh, in 1996 in Lebanon when the Israelis shelled the United Nations shelter and killed 108 civilians, mostly women and children. And Osama bin Laden said, how come your blood is blood, but our blood is water? Wrong. That's what you think, but we'll show you. Simple as that. And guess what? The lead hijacker, Mohammed Atta, who um, had, was the ringleader of the Hamburg cell of hijackers who hijacked three out of the four planes, essentially. Um, the other, the Malaysia cell where the guys that did Flight 77, the San Diego guys, did Flight 77 in the Pentagon. The other three planes, Pennsylvania and the two in New York, were um, Mohammed Atta and his guys, and they were completely motivated by American support for Israel. That was why that same Israeli operation in 1996, Grapes of Wrath in southern Lebanon, was what motivated Mohammed Atta and Ramzi bin al-Sheib when bin Laden put out his declaration of war and cited the Kana massacre, they said, this is the kind of hero we need right here. Let's go to Afghanistan and meet bin Laden and volunteer our services right here. And that was why. And they said that before the Kana massacre, in fact, but just on the beginning of the operation, Grapes of Wrath, Muhammad Atta filled out his last will and testament, which is like your little brother going and joining the Marine Corps to go and fight against the bad guys that threaten us is exactly what it was. And it was, and here's an Egyptian who's studying in Hamburg and is saying the Americans have to pay for what the Israelis are doing in Lebanon. Now try and tell them that to your Aunt Bessie and see if she understands why Americans are dying here because of Israeli war crimes in Lebanon. Where's Lebanon? What's Lebanon? You know, Israel's war crimes, but aren't they our friends? They wouldn't do anything bad. You're, the bad guys are on the bad side. And since we're our side, then we're the good guys. And if you look at the ruling caste of the Israelis, at least, they're white Ashkenazi European Jews who speak English. And so who are you going to side with? A bunch of brown Muslims who speak Arabic that you can't understand? Psh, makes no sense. Why would you? So this whole narrative that Israel is an outpost of Western civilization out there protecting us, psh, it sort of seems plausible on its face if somebody says it to you one time. Okay, I admit it. They're wider. But that's all. That's all. In fact, their war crimes are responsible for provoking the September 11th attack. And in fact, David Petraeus, General Petraeus, and General James Mattis both have said that, look, it's just a fact, speaking from the point of view of the military professionals, they can't ignore it. They must take into account Israeli atrocities, whatever you call them, actions, if you want to be euphemistic about it, against Palestinian civilians causes security problems for America all throughout the region. In Iraq, in Kuwait, in Saudi, in Jordan, in Syria, in Afghanistan. You know, I was talking with Danny Sherson, who's a dissenter, um, but is actually currently even still an army major and is a combat veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. And he said, you know, he was in the Afghan surge, in Obama's surge in Afghanistan, and he would meet with Afghans all the time and ask them, you know, so what's going on with you? What's your beef? What do you think of Americans anyway? We're all here to help you and all this stuff. And they would all start talking about Palestine. A bunch of illiterate, backwoods, hillbilly Afghans saying it's not fair what you helped the Israelis do to the Palestinians. What the hell is the matter with you? And this causes, and these are the people who we're supposed to be winning their hearts and minds, so they'll fight the Taliban for us. And the Israel problem right there where the rubber meets the road, is a problem for American fighting men on the ground in the Middle East. Never mind that it helped provoke the September 11th attack and the Al-Qaeda war against America in the first place, but it continues to make matters more difficult. I'll give you another example. In 2004, in the spring, there was a riot in Fallujah, which was brutally put down, and in reaction... Uh, by the Marines, I believe it was, put down. And then in reaction, the um, Fallujans, some Fallujans, uh, lynched, murdered four Blackwater guards and burnt their corpses and hung them from a bridge. And this was like this 
complete humiliation. America had won the war a year before. And now these people think that they can stand up to us like this and do this. And that was the first time that George Bush sent in General James Mattis to go in there and attack full force with his Marines against Fallujah. And in doing so, they drove, I guess, you know, a few million, a couple of million refugees, at least hundreds of thousands of refugees out of that city and helped lead to all kinds of chains of events and consequences for the future of the civil war there. But what caused the riot? What caused the riot in the first place was that the Israelis used a drone missile airstrike to murder Sheikh Yassin in his wheelchair. One of the old leaders of Hamas who was like in his 90s or something, or late 80s anyway, in his wheelchair. And they killed him with a missile, an airstrike. This is one of the leaders of Hamas. And this is what caused the riot in Fallujah that caused the massacre, that called the, caused the lynching of the Blackwater Guards, that caused the first big battle of Fallujah that really helped to touch off the sectarian civil war in Iraq War II, directly undermining the idea that, oh, here we are to build a government for you. We're not the British here to steal all your stuff, man. We love you. We only came here to save you from Saddam and be your friend. Well, if that's true, how come you're massacring us? How come we have this violent, dominant, uh, dominant, submissive relationship between the U.S. Army and the Iraqi people, if that's really true? And so huge trouble was caused by that, and it was caused by an Israeli policy. And why did they even kill that guy? The Israeli Mossad helped Sheikh Yassin build Hamas in the first place, deliberately, to help divide the Palestinian religious right from the secular commie PLO back in the 1980s and 90s. And then, oh, but they got tired of Hamas, so they just murdered this old man in his wheelchair. And to the direct detriment of American security and society. So, you know, I mean, honestly, there's just not a lick of truth to this. Why are we fighting? If you, if you read the headlines right now, why is it wrong for Donald Trump to leave Syria? Because it empowers Iran. Iran is there in Syria now, and that's a threat to Israel. Go and read Haaretz from late last month, and all the headlines are, Donald Trump doesn't care about Israel. Donald Trump, I guess, hates us after all. Sure, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem, but when it comes to protecting us by staying in Syria, he's the first one to leave. And in fact, go back further to the beginning of December, and you can read in Haaretz where Donald Trump wants to leave Syria. But he can't, and Israel's fingerprints are all over it. That's the headline in Haaretz. America, Americans, who many of whom probably don't even know where Israel is, these young army and Marines, uh, soldiers and Marines, they have to occupy eastern Syria. Kids from Texas and Alabama and New York who have nothing to do with Zionism, who don't even know the first thing about Israel, Palestine, or Iran, or any of these things, all they know is somebody attacked us on September 11, 2001, but they don't know who. These kids got to go fight in Syria. They have to stay in Syria because Israel. Now, how does that benefit the United States of America? No one could say. Yeah, and people don't understand. I'm glad you brought up the point of what actually, like Osama bin Laden's grievances, like the grievances of al-Qaeda of why they did September 11. Um, one being the bases located in Saudi Arabia. The United States is guilty as charged. Doesn't mean they, they deserve 9-11. Two being that the U.S. sanctions on Iraq, killing, what, over 500,000 children? Guilty as Between charged. Between three and 500,000, yeah. yeah. Still doesn't mean that the U.S. deserved 9-11. And number three was the U.S. support of the Jewish state in Israel. Guilty as charged still doesn't mean that the U.S. deserved 9-11. Even though all these three things are true, it still doesn't mean that the U.S. deserved 9-11. No, but all it means is that Osama adopted the morality of George Bush and Bill Clinton that says that if innocent people have to die to accomplish your objective, they're just collateral damage. And that it's perfectly okay to kill civilians. These are matters of state, after all. So in other words, Osama bin Laden has the morality of a Democrat. And that's why he thinks it's okay to kill innocent people. And of course, you know, only, and especially at this late date, it's just not even respectable to sit there 
not you, but I mean, for anyone in your audience or whatever who would pretend to misunderstand that an explanation of someone's reason for their behavior amounts to an excuse and a justification for what they've done. If I say that somebody robbed a bank because they needed to pay for their mom's operation, are you confused for a second? And you could have swore that what I just said was it was perfectly fine for him to stick a gun in a lady's face and take money from the bank. Because I didn't say that, did I? I just said that was why he did what he did, which is true. And, you know, it's funny, too, because it's always the right wingers who call everybody to the left of them a crybaby little snowflake who want to immediately turn and throw a temper tantrum if you hurt their emotions and tread on their little feelings about American national security policy. But look, just pretend that it's been Bill Clinton this whole time. Bill Clinton ran for a third term, and then his wife ran after that, and then Hillary was in charge for the last three terms. There. Now stop crying, right? Now it's been nothing but Democrats did all these horrible things that I said were wrong to do. And now, doesn't that make sense? Democrats are bad leaders, aren't they? They never know what the hell they're doing, do they? And all their crises they create just became, become the justification for the next crisis they create, right? So there, our, all partisanship halted. Bill Clinton was a bad president. So was Hillary. Which, after all, what was Barack Obama other than Hillary and drag anyway? That's all he ever was, was Hillary Clinton anyway. That's why he did all the horrible things he did, because she was his secretary of state and said he had to. Yeah, people voted for him because they thought his instincts were going to be good on the Middle East, but however, they were not. They... And, and literally, she was the one who said, who gave him no running room to back out of the Afghan surge. You know, she was the secretary of state. It was her job to say, oh, I don't know, maybe we don't have to do this. And instead she was like, I think you have to do whatever the generals say, Mr. President. Yeah, thanks a lot, Hillary, right? And then she was the one who said he had to do Libya. You got to do this for me, Barack. You got to let me have this one. I'm going to run in 2016 as the lady who liberated Syria. I mean, Libya, it's going to be great. You got to do it. You got to let me do it. And this was a war directly for Al-Qaeda, the Libyan veterans of Al-Qaeda in Iraq from Iraq War II, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, Ansar al-Sharia. And you know what Barack Obama said? He goes, well, my decision to attack Libya was 51 to 49 right? Not 90, 10, 80, 20, 70, 30, 60, 40, 51 to 49. In other words, he's a war criminal. In other words, he started a war that he himself is happy to admit was unnecessary, but he did it anyway, and he did it for her. And then the same thing with Syria. You can read it in the New York Times. What was the support for the jihad in Syria? Why, that was Hillary Clinton's bank shot. We'll take all of the jihadists and guns from Libya and we'll send them on to the next regime change against Bashar al-Assad. It's right there in the New York Times. I could have sworn it was all because of the gas, the chemical weapons attacks. Oh yeah, that must have been have it. Yeah, and, and by the way, and people can read up about this, but all of the, uh, the three major chemical attacks there have all been proven to be hoaxes perpetrated by al-Qaeda on the ground to try to get America to intervene further on the side of the, uh, on the side of the bin Ladenites against the Iranian axis there. Unfortunately, you know people don't let me add this too. Like how frustrating is it for that? All you ever hear is Iran, 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 Iran is the world's greatest supporter of terrorism. You hear that one over and over again. Iran is this threat. Iran did this, Iran did that. As you listed it before at the top of the show, if we leave Syria, who benefits Assad, Russia, Iran, and ISIS. Well, excuse me, three of those things are allies against the fourth, okay? But they just want to sit there and just lie right to your face and make you believe that ISIS works for Iran. America created ISIS to hurt Iran, and then America helped Iran kill ISIS because it got a little too big and out of control. I think the issue is, though, is that a lot of people just see all these Muslims working together. So they just That's the point. Group. That's like, exactly. We're all just crazy, radical Muslims, and they all must be on the same side. That's so, exactly uh, what they want. And that, honestly, it's the Zionist narrative more than anything else. And it's the American one, too. But essentially, look, everybody that Israel wants to steal land from is an Arab, and most of them are Muslims. And the American people have no idea that, like, 20% of them are Christians. 
They keep that off of TV. And so if they can make you hate and fear Muslims in Afghanistan or Iraq, that's just as well to help them get away with stealing land that they covet from the West Bank, from the Palestinians who live there, land that they wish to steal. And so it's as simple as that. It's all just a giant bogus propaganda campaign. And if you took the, the shoe and put it on the other foot on the Israel-Palestine question, well, you would have your answer in about 15 seconds. What if the Palestinians had won the war of 67 and had herded all the Israeli Jews into the West Bank and the Gaza Strip concentration camp and kept them under siege and bombed them and attacked them and sent their military to kidnap their children out of their beds in the middle of the night and put them in, in front of military star train chambers conducted in a foreign language? Right, America would send the Marine Corps. America would invade to save the Jews from the Palestinians. If the shoe was on the other foot, we would invade tomorrow. And that's all you need to know, to know that what America is helping the Israelis do to the Palestinians is absolutely wrong. And the frust something frustrating I find is that whenever you criticize Israeli foreign policy, whenever you go as far as criticizing Zionism, then all of a sudden you become an anti-Semite when that is not the case whatsoever. You know what? I actually look at that as just an opportunity to clarify and explain more and better. I'll tell you uh, an analogy here. Um, my friend Dave Smith. Oh, you mentioned Dave Smith at the beginning there. Um, so my friend Dave, he used to have this show. I'm sure you've seen. Uh, he was a guest, a regular guest on the SE Cup show on CNN. I'm familiar with just, her work. Yeah. So she's just horrible on everything. Um, um, and it's just very much just status quo talking points, conventional wisdom talking points, especially about Assad, for example, and the war in Syria. And I was talking with Dave one time and I was saying, I was really glad that she's that terrible. And I thought it would be a bad idea for him to try to really teach her the truth and really help her to be better because I didn't think that would work, first of all. But then second of all, I think she made a really great foil for him because she really believed the wrong things that she was saying. And so she would always leave a great opportunity for him to explain that actually that's not really true. It's really much more like this than it is like that. And um, so that's how I kind of look at it is if somebody goes, oh, when you just hate Israel because you're anti-Semitic. I look at that as they're just pitching me a softball so that I can explain that. No, actually, all the racism here is against the Palestinians, not the Israeli Jews at all. And the fact of the matter is anyone who actually is an anti-Semite will be happy to tell you so and will be happy to try to get you to hate Jews, too. OK, there's no no one who actually really is an anti-Semite just goes around talking about Palestinians because they want to get away with somehow opposing Israel. That's just stupid and wrong. The people who care about Palestinians include the majority of American Jews, a substantial, like two-thirds supermajority of American Jews want the Palestinians to have an independent state out from under Israeli occupation and to be free. And so, um, you know, that ought to prove the case right there. And why is that? right? It's because American Jews are liberals. And they don't put loyalty to some ethnic tribe above their belief in equal rights for all human beings, blacks, Jews, and Palestinians too. And so that's it. And now to say that it's anti-Semitic to argue that Jews don't have the right to violate the rights of other people is just stupid. You know what it is? It's just the last refuge of a scoundrel who's got no argument left to make. The fact of the matter is that it's an apartheid state over there. If somebody said to you that if you wanted to end apartheid Jim Crow segregation in Texas or in Mississippi in the 1950s, is that anti-white racism? And you hate white people if you think that Jim Crow segregation against blacks must end? and that they deserve equal rights with whites, that would be stupid, wouldn't it? Yeah, of course it would. And so that's exactly what it is when Israeli Jews or American Zionists, whether Jews or otherwise, try to hide behind that and say, oh, this is just anti-Semitism. It's not anti-Semitism to say that everyone else on earth has just exactly as much natural rights as a Jew does, or as any other person does. And and, you know, frankly, that's been the Western tradition since the 1600s. 
And, you know, especially the 1700s and, and right around the time of the American Revolution and our Declaration of Independence, where, you know, the foundational principles, supposedly at least, undergirding the, you know, the, the civil society in America is that everybody is born free. It wasn't that King George III had no divine right. It was that everybody had just as much divine right as him. And so who the hell was he? to boss us around. Well, that, those exact principles are absolutely universal and apply to the Palestinians. Now, that does not mean that I think that, oh, America must invade China to free Tibet because their natural rights are not being respected. But it does mean that I would absolutely and eternally oppose any American support for the Chinese persecution of the people of Tibet. Now, their liberation is their problem. Turning my country into a totalitarian dictatorship and world empire in order to free the rest of mankind is a red herring and is ridiculous and is, is not an option. But right now, the apartheid Jim Crow segregation system, the absolutely illegitimate, the criminal system that Israel imposes on the people of Palestine is done on my dime and in my name. Unfortunately, and all of us too. Unfortunately, though, when you when you point things out like the border wall in Israel goes into Palestinian territory and actually annexes land, or when you point things out like the Gaza Strip is actually just a concentration camp with two million people there, or when you point things out that there are racial colonies in the West Bank that have that have uh, is Jewish and Palestinian roads. Um, unfortunately, the Ben Shapiro's and the Dennis Prager's of the world, um, as soon as you say that, they have no argument and they just say, well, Hamas. Well, Hamas and you're an anti-Semite. Right. And the answer to which is, well, Israel shouldn't have created Hamas to be a right-wing religious counter to the PLO in the first place then. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is, you know, the last time Hamas did a suicide attack was like in the year 2000 or something. Or, eh, it could have, been, could have been like 2004. But um, many governments, including the government of Israel in particular, start out as terrorist groups who seize power. And this, we've seen the same thing with Hezbollah. Now, Israel did not deliberately create Hezbollah. They accidentally created Hezbollah by invading southern Lebanon to attack Palestinian refugees there and the PLO there. And they started, they just stayed. And they started mercilessly persecuting this Shiite Lebanese of southern Lebanon who hadn't done anything to them. And in fact, at first had welcomed them to come and get rid of the PLO who were mostly unwanted guests. But the Israelis stayed and started lording it over the local Shia. So that was only then in 1982, late 82, 83, is when they created what's now the party of God, Hezbollah as a local insurgent resistance group against them. And they did use suicide bomb tactics uh, and terrorist tactics against not just the IDF, but against Israeli civilians as well, until the occupation ended. And when the occupation ended in the year 2000, Hezbollah has not done a single terrorist attack against Israel since then. They are now not just a militia group. They're now one of the biggest political parties and most powerful political parties in Lebanon which the government of which the U.S. supports, and they are in the ruling coalition with the Christians right now. And they do still have, Hezbollah still has arms, so they're kind of a mini state within a state uh, with their own armaments separate from the Lebanese government. But essentially, they're part of the Lebanese government. And they grew into something more than a terrorist group. And that doesn't mean I love Nasrallah. That doesn't mean that, to say anything necessarily good about them other than to say a terrorist group can become something else. And it's the same thing in the case of Hamas. You know, Ayman al-Zawahiri from Al-Qaeda hates Hamas and denounces the Muslim Brotherhood, which Hamas is a break-off part of the Muslim Brotherhood out of Egypt. And Zawahiri, who used to be one of the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, but left it, denounces them because they participate in elections. They participate in negotiations with Israel. They, you know, and... And, you know, work with uh, in the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which also 
you know, is not really a radical revolutionary organization. They're Islamist, but they're conservative. They're old, rich guys, basically, that, uh, that run the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Um, so they're not really radicals like uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri. And in fact, whenever any al-Qaeda-type groups have popped up their heads in Gaza, which has happened, I think, two or three times, Hamas has just murdered them, just straight up, like, attacked them with their Kassam Brigade or whatever, not, not sent police, but sent their armed force to just this Bin Ladenite mosque, everybody in there is dead today. And they've done that two or three times. Um, and so this is why Al-Qaeda absolutely hates Hamas. And then, of course, Netanyahu just lies and goes, oh, Hamas is Al-Qaeda, is ISIS, is Iran. <laughs> Come on. I mean, this, this guy's jerking your chain, man. That's what's going on here. Is, that's why the things that he says don't really make sense. That's why, you know, I remember learning this in seventh grade. They taught us about advertising techniques. Always beware of glittering generalities. When somebody says radical Islam, you say radical compared to what? Radical rich, which direction? Radical out of what geographical base? Radical with financing from who? You know, don't just let somebody buffalo you with some overly broad terms. We're talking about individual human beings here. If they can't define what they're talking about in specific, it's probably because they're lying. They're trying to conflate issues the same way they try to, com to conflate the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. The same way they try to conflate, you know, the Muslims over there, Sunni and Shia, everything. As you said, it's all just over there. It's all far away. You know, Thomas Friedman one of the most important public intellectuals in America, the New York Times. Um, he once went on the Charlie Rose show, uh, Charlie Rose on, on PBS, and he was one of the big supporters of the Iraq war. And then here it was like two years later, and he goes, you know what, Charlie? I figured out now finally why we did the Iraq war. <laughs> he was one of the supporters of it. Oh, okay. So now he's figured it out. And then he goes on to this weird, you know, metaphor about bubbles, stock market bubbles and housing bubbles and terrorism bubbles. And so these terrorists were under the illusion that they could do whatever they wanted without getting hit back. And so that built up a bubble in their power. And so our job was to pop that bubble and let them know that that wasn't true. So the whole thing is kind of stupid the way he sets it up. But then he says, we could have gone to Saudi Arabia. We could have gone to Pakistan, but instead we just decided we had to go from Baghdad to Basra and say, you think that you can mess with us? Well, suck on this. And then, by the way, Charlie Rose interrupts to say, okay. And then, but so the joke is, right, that we just had to kill somebody and it didn't matter who. Afghanistan is too remote to make an effective demonstration of American power. And so we had to find something else to bomb. And then what does he say? We could have bombed Saudi. Uh, their intelligence agency built Al-Qaeda in the first place. Sure didn't stop the attack on us, when if anybody could have, it could have been them. And if anybody did it outside of Al-Qaeda, it was Saudi intelligence that did it. They certainly did it with Saudi prince's money to finance the whole thing. So we could have bombed Saudi. We could have bombed Pakistan, where Pakistan, hey, they supported the Taliban, which so did Bill Clinton, and he asked the Pakistanis to do it. Um, that wasn't the same thing as al-Qaeda, but at least you could argue some kind of tangent. But then he says, we had to go to Iraq. We decided Iraq, and we go from Baghdad to Basra. Wasn't that funny? He didn't even say from Fallujah to Mosul, where at least you might have found someone who was sympathetic with bin Laden. But in the land, all the land from Baghdad down to Basra is all Shiite territory. You can't find a single ally of Osama bin Laden, not one man who's an ally of Osama bin Laden in the land between Baghdad and Basra in 2003, not one. This is the morality of Americans, of the American policymakers, that they can just mass murder women and children that in their own conception, had nothing to do with threatening us or attacking us in any way ever. But just because someone else did something to make an example to still another third party after that. And they have killed a million people. A million. And that's the low number now because we've had wars in Libya and Syria and et cetera since then. 
We've had an absolute catastrophe this whole time. And based on Iraq is doable, based on the Israelis, our, our neocons say that it'll be easy and fine. Let's just go for it. And as Donald Trump says, none of this had to happen at all. He said the biggest mistake in, that any American president has ever made, which is really not true, but still, was when George Bush invaded Iraq, when he knocked over the whole Middle East and got us bogged down the whole Middle East. Donald Trump, the Republican president, in, in other words, is saying the whole 21st century, Henry, didn't have to happen. The whole 21st century, it didn't have to be this way at all. That war that started on September 11th when you were in seventh grade, it could have been over by Christmas Day. Unfortunately, the old tactic of saying Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden in every single sentence, that's what happened afterwards. And like the point you said a million people, over a million people, that's a low estimate. That's actually when I changed my opinion. When I was younger, I was, uh, when I was in high school, um, all I knew is that a bunch of pissed off Muslims blew up a building in my own city. And um, I live in New York. And um, go ahead, do whatever you want. Go ahead, boys. Like, I support you. I don't want to know what happens. I just want revenge over that. And then when I finally looked at the actual casualty numbers, when I looked at the, the casualty numbers were in the millions is when I was like, I, I cannot morally support this. This would be just, this would be an inhumane and disgusting thing to support. So I encourage people who are on the fence, who are not sure about U.S. foreign policy or just confused by it all, just look at the, look at the casualty numbers. It's all one-sided. Yeah, and, and look, at the time of the September 11th attack, Al-Qaeda was 400 men, mostly Saudis and Egyptians hiding out in Afghanistan. It wasn't the government of Afghanistan, the Taliban, that attacked us. It wasn't the government of any country that attacked us. It was a stateless group of bandits, some outlaws. And rather than destroy us, they were trying to get us to destroy ourselves. They are trying to provoke your exact reaction. Here's a blank check, George Bush. Here's a blank writ. Go and get them for me. And he knew that the American people would trust Bush to protect them. And he knew he could trust Bush to defy that trust and to exploit that trust and to take full advantage and do everything he could. That was the whole reason they attacked us in the first place was to, to provoke this kind of crisis. And you talk about, remember we were talking before about American foreign policies that provoke the attack. It sure doesn't justify it. And I was saying, yeah, how Osama has the same morality as the American imperialists, that no matter how many individual civilian human beings have to die, it doesn't really matter. We got to do what we got to do, and that's just collateral damage, or whatever. Well, this was Bin Laden's point of view, too. I mean, think about it. He wanted to replicate the Soviet war in Afghanistan from the 1980s with America in the place of the USSR. But that war killed a million Afghans. And he was witness to that. He was there. You think the American war in Afghanistan is bad? The Soviets killed a million people. And Bin Laden's attitude was let's replicate that. Kill them all, let God sort them out. Doesn't matter. In the long term, America will go bankrupt and be forced to leave the Middle East entirely. And Danny that's Gerson. the long game he was playing. He didn't even care if he died in it. Danny Jerson on my show, um, he said, exact words were, the Soviet invasion of Af Afghanistan makes the American invasion look like child's play. Yeah, no, it's true. It's absolutely brutal. And you know what? Bin Laden said... Um, in 1998, he was interviewed by a reporter named Abdel Bari Atwan. He took credit for the Kobar Towers attack. And he also said he took credit for shooting down the helicopter in Black Hawk Down in Somalia in 1993 when Operation Restore Hope by bringing food aid turned into an attempt to assassinate a warlord named Adid and a battle where a bunch of Rangers and Delta operators were killed. And Bin Laden said, he later at least claimed that he had sent the men to shoot that helicopter down, that those were his men that did that, and that their purpose was to try to provoke Bill Clinton into expanding the war. In Bin Laden's words, I wanted to fight a war of attrition against the Americans there in Somalia the same way that we had done against the Russians in Afghanistan. 
So he was saying this in 1998, that this was his whole goal was to make you really mad so you do something stupid, so that you would take care of all of his problems for him. And so here's a man with no power at all. He's got 400 men. He's, and he needs 20 essentially special forces guys to carry out one big mission undercover on American soil in order to set off America's policy that he wanted. So then when America went to Iraq to get Saddam Hussein, did a regime change in Yemen against Abdul Saleh, did a regime change against Gaddafi in Libya, a half-assed attempted regime change against Assad in Syria, and of course, still on, in, in our sites, our government sites, are the Ayatollah and the Mullahs in Iran. None of these countries had anything to do with supporting Al-Qaeda. None of these countries had anything to do with the 9-11 attack on the United States at all. The Bush and then the Obama administration simply used the 9-11 attack as a pretext to do whatever they wanted. So, you know, like when 9-11 truthers think that George Bush and Dick Cheney did the attack themselves, I can't blame them for that. I disagree with that. But they cynically exploited it so badly that they might as well have. You know, telling some guy, listen, I need your son to go attack Iraq because Iraq could give chemical weapons to Osama bin Laden to use against us. That's essentially murder, right? Lying to some guy to give up his son to go fight a war based on false pretenses. They exploited that, that attack so badly they might as well have done it. And then, and, and I mean, and just think of that. It's unthinkable. And this is, you know, it goes back to, this started out, I think, as an accusation against Jews by Hitler, but it ended up being adopted by the Nazis. And in fact, I read a quote recently of, I think, Goering or Himmler or one of them saying, you know, describing how the big lie works. You say something that's untrue, but so outrageous that people would prefer to believe the lie than to believe that you would tell such a lie. You're telling me that George W. Bush is looking me right in my eye and telling me I got to give up my son to go and fight to defend America when actually he's cynically exploiting my grief and my fear in order to start a war against people who had nothing to do with that attack? <laughs> I think you just hate Bush, boy. And that was the reaction. The problem must be you. If you're trying to convince me that my leadership hates me so much that after a, a tragedy like this, that they would lie to my face and exploit me like this, the problem must be you, not them. And so this is really, you know, you look at all the left right division in America now and all the hatred, and it was already there to a degree. But, you know, when Bush and Gore ran against each other, they ran on the same platform, man. There wasn't really there much to fight about other than a little bit of identity politics. But it was Iraq War II where Bush made half, you know, half the population line up behind him and a giant pile of fake excuses to commit war crimes, to start a war. And then when the torture scandal came out, he said, it's not torture, but yeah, you're damn right, we torture people, we have to. And all good conservative American Republican patriots also support torture, don't you, everyone? And, and demanded that the American right rally behind him in order to protect himself and all of a sudden all become a bunch of barbarians who support torture when they never were before, a bunch of torture mongers. And now they are because George Bush demands it. And he had half the American people saying, I can't believe that you liberal weaklings don't want to defend America from Iraq that attacked us on 9-11. And you had the other half of the country going, no, you idiots, Iraq didn't do 9-11. Bush is just jerking your chain, dumb, dumb. And so then it just escalated and escalated the hatred between each side there. I mean, imagine if you really believe that Saddam did 9-11, and if you really believe that 150 million Americans thought that we ought to let him get away with it he would think pretty bad about those 150 million Americans, right? Well, that was the line of BS that George Bush forced the American right to accept about everybody else who knew better than them. 
And so, you know, that I think had so much to do with the hatred between left and right now. And of course, part of the backlash against Bush was the election of Barack Obama, who was seen, even though it's not true, was seen as some kind of radical left wing, Black Panther, Muslim terrorist agent, blah, blah, garbage by the right. And so has them reacting, you know, that much worse against him. And so you have the pendulum swinging furiously now between left and right poles and mostly over a bunch of garbage, mostly over because they, because George Bush insisted that your dad and your uncle and your minister and your baseball coach and your homeroom teacher all support torture so that he wouldn't go to prison for torturing people to death. So he said, no, we're all a bunch of torture mongers, aren't we guys? And the American right went, yeah, torture. And then everyone else went, no, you people are barbarians. That's the whole definition of Western civilization is that you're protected from being compelled to uh, come up with evidence against yourself in the Fifth Amendment. The government is banned from cruel and unusual treatment in the Eighth Amendment. That's the basis of our civilization is that we are not barbarians. We're civilized and we refuse to stoop to that level. Isn't that what we're trying to conserve here, guys? The red, white, and blue and the U.S. Bill of Rights. And instead, they help drive all that into the ground. And, 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 and look at the backlash. Although, you know, I got to admit, though, that the American right, at least, they got over Bush pretty quick. And when Donald Trump denounced Bush and announced Bush's wars, they elected him. And, you know, I don't think the Democrats will disown Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton for the next 30 years. But at least the right, when it finally came down to it, said, you know what? George Bush always was George Bush's son. It's not like he was Ronald Reagan's boy or anything. He was just George Bush's boy. And it turned out. Maybe they don't understand all that Sunni Shia garbage I was saying, but they know it didn't work. They know it was supposed to be easy. It was supposed to be fun. It was supposed to make us feel good for getting some revenge for 9-11 against, obviously, people who had nothing to do with it. But anyway, and it turned into this giant years-long quagmire and all that, and then an economic crash. Before the end of the Bush presidency, the market crashed in September on his watch still. And so that kind of cemented the end of his legacy and the end of Republican loyalty to his legacy. You know, too late, unfortunately. If that crash had happened in 07 instead of 08, oh my God, can you imagine the Ron Paul campaign? Can you imagine the fight if the economy had already crashed instead it crashed a month before the election? when It was already too late for anything to change when John McCain was already the nominee. But anyway. Well, you can make progress with people on the right. Like, like you say all the time, you need to attack the right from the right and the left from the left. If you say things to people on the right, like, don't you want to see more videos of soldiers returning to their pets go viral? Like, don't you want to see more guys come home? Don't you want to see these yeah. guys be taken care of? I mean, that's where you really gain sympathy points with them. That's yeah. when you can really get them to, your, to their side. I mean, Trump even Trump in South Carolina, which is, you know, it, it's military central of the United States. Mm -hmm. He said that they lied us into Iraq. And I think he even said that it might have been it might have been a different speech. I think it was South Carolina. He says those uh those uh drone strikes in Syria, um they're saying they're not killing civilians. I think they're lying to us. I think they are actually killing civilians. And it's getting a, a thunderous applause in South Carolina. So the right wing, not all of it, is um they feel they, that they've been fooled. And I think that's why you see guys like Tucker Carlson now. Like mm -hmm. Tucker Carlson, like what other, what other uh, voice on mainstream news questions, questions the, the military state? I, right. Tucker Carlson's the only one. And now Laura Ingram's actually even coming around as well, which, is, which I couldn't believe. You would think over the years that Tucker, uh, not Tuck, Laura Ingram and Rachel Maddow, they switched brains. Right. Yeah, isn't that funny? Um, and yet, you know, I mean, the thing of it is, too, is, you know, there's a lot of, hey, let's be tough and let's kick butt and let's be violent and be alpha monkeys and whatever and that kind of feeling on the right. We're number one and all of that. But at the end of the day, like in a fight doesn't necessarily equate to wanting to conquer the planet Earth. And most American right wingers are essentially nationalists and essentially 
it's the USA that they love. That's why they like kicking ass to defend the USA. But, you know, conquer everything and rule everyone, protect Mongolia from China if it comes down to it. I mean, that doesn't really add up to them. It takes much more of this neoconservative, Trotskyite, liberal do gooder kind of great society ideology that says that America is powerful enough to remake the world, to wage a world revolution and change the way things are to the way we want them to be. That sounds kind of crazy to a real conservative. Um, it is crazy. And it is, you know, it, essentially it is the Wilsonian view on steroids. That's what Max Boot called it, hard Wilsonianism, right? As a Woodrow Wilson wasn't willing to kill a few million people, you know? Um, but anyway, uh, that's what they call it, hard Wilsonianism. But it has baked into it all of these fantasies about the future of, you know, a remade humanity as its justification. And so, you know, when George Bush pronounces that right when everybody's still angry, then they're like, okay, you know, they go along with that and all that. But at the end of the day, really, over dinner, does your old man really believe America's got to occupy every country in Africa to make sure they elect good men and enforce good laws and low taxes and black-robed judges and an independent, you know, judiciary? Or that's completely crazy and stupid, and why would they? And, and isn't most of that a pretext simply for exercising American military dominance over the rest of the world anyway? You know, on, so on one hand, it's not really true. And on the other hand, it's a pretty ridiculous pretext anyway, that everything America does is just like that time we saved France from the Nazis. Well, it's just not true. You know, that time that we went to war in Korea killed two or three million people. The time we went to war in Vietnam killed three to five, if you count Laos and Cambodia. Three to five million human beings exploded to death by the USA. That's not like that time we saved France from the Nazis, is it? That's more like the time that the Nazis did something to somebody. Um, and we see this kind of repeated. So, you know, it takes a lot of ideology, right? It takes a lot of narrative building to justify this kind of intervention. Otherwise, it's pretty obvious, right? To you, to your little brother, to the old guy down the street, that if we're the superpower, if we're number one, then how could anybody ever mess with us? We got weak and friendly neighbors to our north and south. We have two giant oceans which prevent any power from ever trying to launch some kind of land invasion of our country. You know how many troop ships China would have to build to try to sail across the Pacific and land in California? That's not going to happen for the next 700 years, okay? Um, we're safe. Everything's fine. And if we quit supporting the Israelis, we'd quit having a bunch of Egyptians studying in Hamburg join up with some Saudis hiding in Afghanistan to knock buildings into our towers to trick us into invading Iraq and going bankrupt. Yeah, didn't Ron Paul say that uh, you can protect, I think he said something like, you can protect this country with a couple submarines. I love that. Yeah, he said that to the Washington Post, too, which they were just so mad. <laughs> it was great. He goes, yeah, we can defend this country with a couple of good submarines with a wave of his hand. Don't give me this nonsense. Ain't no threat. And you know what? Like, I have a map here in front of me. I'm sure you have a globe in your house. Just take a look. Take a spin through the globe. There is no power in the Americas except the United States of America, Okay. There's Canada is the second wealthiest country in the Americas, and they're nothing compared to us. They have the gross domestic product of Maine or New Hampshire or something. No military force to speak of other than the U.S. Army, right? Nothing. Next after them is Brazil. They have no military force at all. If anything, you know, they throw their weight around uh, South America a little bit. But could you imagine Brazil posing a threat to American dominance in the in the Americas in the rest of your lifetime? Absolutely not. Then you go to Europe, every single nation in Europe is our ally or at least friend, and that includes Russia, who 
you know, America might be trying to pick a cold war with them, but they're not doing anything to us. Um, instead of sitting there, uh, they pose no threat to America or even to the Baltics or to anyone at all. Then you look at Africa, there is no power in Africa, right? The most powerful country in Africa would be Egypt and they're nothing. They're a sock puppet dictatorship owned by the USA, Saudi and Israel. Then in the Middle East, the closest you got is Iran. They have the GDP of New Jersey. They have no Navy except some fiberglass speedboats, and they have no Air Force that says some old F-4s and F-14s that Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford sold them, um, all of which you know our Navy could take care of in about 45 minutes or something like that. Um, and, and, and the only power there and influence they're spreading throughout the region is at America's hand, right? Why is Iran more powerful in Iraq? Because of George W. Bush. Why are they more powerful in Syria? Because of Barack Obama. Why are they more powerful in Yemen? They really haven't gained any real power in Yemen, but America gives them credit for all the Houthis' victories in Yemen, so they've grown more powerful from that. Otherwise, they're not doing anything to anyone. And then you have India, which you know, has a problem with Pakistan, but they're not an expansionist power in any other way other than you know, their perpetual quarrel over the Kashmir region there. And then you have China, our second biggest trading partner after Canada, and a country that we have no legitimate reason to have a fight with in any way. Um, they're trying to dominate in the South China Sea, which is like accusing America of trying to dominate in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, doesn't amount to a threat to the United States whatsoever. And then keep spinning. You're out of world. It's a round planet. You get back to the West Coast of America again. You're out of continents. You're out of even potential adversaries. There are none. There are no nation states in the world that threaten America. The closest we have is China, Russia, and Iran are powerful enough, oh, and North Korea with their nukes, are powerful enough to keep us out, to keep us from dominating them. That's the closest you could get to spinning up a threat against the United States of America. In other words, Donald Trump is just absolutely right. It doesn't have to be this way at all. It didn't have to be this way from the entire Cold War on. We didn't have to go to Iraq War I at all. We didn't have to do any of this. We could have had peace time your whole lifetime. Didn't have to be this way. Yeah, but then we can't build F-35s. Yeah, well, you know what? We still can't. <laughs> yeah, we well, still we can, can build them, but they fall right out of the sky. We can build a helmet. We can build yeah. a helmet, but we can't build the rest of the plane. Yeah, and if you hit the eject button, it, the helmet will take your head off. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, we actually did an episode. My co-host is um, he's um, more into like the military tech side, and he mm -hmm. we break down. We have these episodes where we break down military equipment and just try to go over if it's worth it or not. Um, you just, they're not, <laughs> they're yeah. not at all. Well, you know, they just, uh, six weeks ago or something, they announced first F-35 combat mission. We bombed a drug lab in Afghanistan. How do you like that? A trillion dollar plane to bomb a couple of thousand dollars worth of heroin, allegedly in a war we already lost. But then they couldn't crow about the news. They announced it for a minute. But then they buried it. You know why? Because the same day, an F-35 fell out of the sky in North Carolina and crash landed on the ground. So that was their big celebration of their first combat mission. It was another plane just like it fell right out of the sky. Yeah, but there's no other plane that has stealth technology like the F-35 <laughs> and that's multi-what use that can, <laughs> that can hover like a helicopter. And uh, it's, just, it's insane. Yeah. You but, know, uh, there's actually, if you search, uh, the guy's name is Pierre Spray, um, or S-P-R-E-Y, I think. And there's this hilarious interview that he gives to a Canadian news company about the F-35. And um, he's the designer of the F-15 and the F-16. So he explains, actually, that the F-15 he designed with a gun to his head, basically, because he hated it and it was a piece of junk, but they made him do it because it was expensive, even though it was slow and lousy. But then he also tells the story that him and some other Lockheed engineers secretly off the books at lunchtime or down in the basement or something went ahead and designed the F-16 that actually is 
a useful weapons platform or however they call it. And they had to basically ram it through the corporate process to get this much cheaper, lighter, faster, more maneuverable in every way, more useful in every way F-16 fighter made um, back in the 70s. He tells that story. But then he goes to talk about the F-35. And he says the F-35 is not a failure. The F-35 is absolutely successful at its mission, which is not countering Russian fifth generation jet technology. The purpose of the F-35 is transferring money out of the U.S. Treasury and into the accounts at Lockheed. That's it. That's what it's for. And that's why it's a piece of junk. And that's why if it ever did have to go head to head with the latest Russian MiGs, the pilots would die. Because the Russians are designing their planes for real necessity and trying to save money. They don't have it built where the whole thing is just a giant scam to try to loot you out of every last dime. If any of this had anything to do with American military security, and never mind a libertarian point of view or anything, but I just mean all other things being equal. If this had anything to do with American security, they would be building more F-16s and possibly F-15s. Now they can jam their nose cone with so much electronics and stuff that they're much more useful than they used to be. Um, and F-18 Hornets for the Navy, I guess, all of which come at a unit price far below the F-35 and all of which are far superior jets to the F-35, which is not stealthy, which is not fast, which cannot climb, which cannot turn, which cannot shoot, which camera doesn't work, which software doesn't work, which software is not compatible with any other plane or the ship you're trying to land on or any other thing. It can't fly in the rain. It can't, you can't f store its fuel in the sun. I mean, the whole thing is just, this is a complete, um, it's a conspiracy against the American treasury. That's the purpose of the F-35 is stealing. And that comes from one of Lockheed's top designers. That's how he phrases it. Yeah, it's, um, it's having the most expensive mil uh, military equipment or the most expensive military technology doesn't necessarily make it the best military technology. Right. Just, it certainly uh, depends on the mission. I mean, even assume it worked, okay? Assume it worked. You're still talking about the Lamborghini of jet fighters when, you know, the Lamborghini is good for drag racing with your friends or whatever, but it's really not a great everyday driver, is it? It's really not, you know, the same thing with the F-35. It's no good for ground support. It's no good for dog fighting. It's no good for, you know, really any particular task that it was supposed to uh, take care of. You know, there was a big fight in the Air Force about getting rid of the A-10 Warthog. Now, this is the plane that flies low and slow. It has those big engines in the back. The pilot sits in what they call a titanium bathtub so that he is essentially impervious to ground fire. And they have these, what they call the Vulcan cannon, this just insane Gatlin gun, machine gun, and ground uh, attack missiles. And they can fly really low and slow without stalling out. I don't know exactly what's the minimum speed, but it's very slow. So an A-10 pilot can look out the window and see those guys have American flags on their shoulders. Those guys do not. And it's easy. I mean, they can just see right there who's shooting at who, which direction on which side of the hill, and lay down ground fire to protect American GIs on the ground. Never mind what mission they're on and what they're doing there in the first place and all that, but just all other things being equal. Well, the F-35 flies at 40,000 feet, and the camera doesn't work. And even if it did, they would still be killing the wrong people. And what they were trying to do, the Air Force was trying to abolish the A-10 Warthog and completely replace it with the F-35, even though they knew the F-35 is not and will never be ready to be a ground attack support plane in that same role as the A-10. And so I'm not saying I'm a big supporter of the A-10, but I'm just saying all other things being equal, this essentially is a conspiracy against Army and Marine Corps infantry. That the Air Force doesn't want to be, you know, air support, ground support, for infantry on the ground. They want to fly fast and drop big bombs on faraway targets with laser guidance and this kind of thing. 
let the army get their own damn A-10s if they need, you know, air cover in their ground battles is the Air Force's attitude. And if they have to throw out all the A-10s in order to ram through a few more F-35s, that's their priority. And it took congressmen making them stop, which is funny because usually when the Pentagon wants to cancel a weapons program and the, and the Congress won't let them, it's usually, you know, an example of the worst form of graft. You know what I mean? But in this case, it's sort of, no, it's really more like the Air Force has this pathological attachment to the worthless F-35 and they're willing to sacrifice American lives on the ground in order to make more money. Simple as that. Yeah, and more jobs as well. I'm reading uh, The War State right now, and it's really, uh -huh. it's, uh, it's great. And it's, it explains how they try to sell these military projects with jobs, and they, they threaten senators that if you, if you vote against this project, then you will be directly interfering with, with jobs and you will not be voted into office. You will lose your seat. You will lose your job. Yeah, no, it's a big problem. And Lockheed especially are the masters of this, them and Boeing. Um, and, and Raytheon and General Dynamics and General Atomics and whatever. They all do this. Where they spread out the jobs to, for the creation of the parts for the weapons to as many congressional districts as they can. It's just, you know, essentially gerrymandering in a way. Um, and so, and there's just no mystery that it absolutely works. I mean, um, you know, we see it in the nuclear weapons industry too. They actually have a nuclear weapons caucus in the Senate that is not made up of wonky types who are very interested in nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons policy in order to best keep people safe or anything like that. No, they're from the States where the nuclear weapons are made. And they're there to represent the interests of the government national laboratories and Honeywell and the other companies that manufacture H-bombs. Now, if you just asked Honeywell, how many H-bombs does America need? The answer would be a million. They would sell you H-bombs forever until you quit buying them. And just like in any other industry, the guys that make the H-bombs lobby Congress to buy more H-bombs. And, you know, it's like the diffusion of responsibility. Hey, if Congress didn't want the H-bombs, they wouldn't buy them from us. If the government didn't need them for American security, hey, we can make them buy H-bombs. But, of course, yeah, they can. They get to hide behind that. But they spend millions of dollars hiring lobbyists, to deal with the House and deal with the Senate and twist those arms and do everything they can to make sure that the Congress will buy more nukes. And if you don't, we'll back your primary opponent in the next election. Just the same as if we we're talking about the NRA or if we we're talking about the AARP or if we we're talking about banking or the pharmaceutical industry or agribusiness. It's the exact same thing with the arms manufacturers up to and including H-bombs. As far as they're concerned, they have to do everything they can to get the U.S. government to give them as much money as possible for as little product as they can uh, put out, of course, and to no end until someone else stops them. Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so we're going on we're at like about two hours right now. Wow. That's uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be about dinner time. Yeah. Um, Scott, I know you're writing a new book, right? Yeah. It's going to be on the terror wars, right? Yeah. So Fool's Errand, the Afghanistan book started out life as this book, the war, the book about all the wars. And then, so I wrote chapter one is getting into this mess, all the Carter through Clinton years stuff that we talked about essentially. And then chapter two was Afghanistan. But then I got bogged down in the Afghan quagmire and I couldn't quite wrap it up. And I knew the story I wanted to tell. I had a pretty b brief outline for the chapter and it just, man, it turned into a book. And once, once chapter two was about 25,000 words, I realized that people are not going to wait around. They're not going to read all this before they get to Iraq, you know, where all the, the heat and the heart of everything that happened is in Iraq war two, especially. So I got to spend all this time 
in the Afghan mountains on the far side of Persia from where all the action is before they even get to chapter three. And I've already written way more than I thought. And ah, what the hell, I guess I'll just make a book about Afghanistan. So at that point, I would just went ahead and in here. Okay, that's good. Wait, oh, microphone online. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we're good now. Thanks, man. Okay. I appreciate it. Sorry, sorry, yeah, for sorry about the, that, man. Yeah, no problem, man. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I appreciate the patience. But, yeah, yeah, uh, no yeah, we were just getting at... Um, oh, the book, yeah. yeah. So, um, so this book is going to be, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Syria, Iraq War Two and Three, Mali, Niger, Nigeria. And I'm going to try to do it all in 250 pages or something, hopefully less than 300 pages. So it's not going to be comprehensive in terms of telling the story but it's going to be hopefully telling you everything you really need to understand about American Middle East policy from Jimmy Carter through right now and, uh, and why there ain't a damn bit of it to believe in. Well, I'm, I'm honestly pretty thankful that you, uh, you bogged down into Afghanistan because you really helped a lot of people understand the Afghan war. Um, we didn't even really talk about Afghanistan today, which is kind of funny. Yeah. Um, however, everyone, everyone, do yourself a huge favor, uh, pick up Scott's book, Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. Um, There's it, an audio book too. Audio book as well. I've actually listened to the audio book and uh, you oh. narrate it yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. When's, uh, when's the date? Do you have like a date? Uh, no, to- I mean, I, I really want it to be done by summer, but I think if I'm lucky, I mean, judging by the, the time scale on Fool's Aaron, I'll be lucky if I get it done basically on the same time scale. So it would be August of this year, but I'm going to try to really go as fast as I can. Um, Cause I, I really want it to be out this spring and, and have a role in this current debate about leaving Syria and Afghanistan and more. So I don't know if that's really going to happen or not, but um, uh, certainly going to try to do as fast as I can. Yeah, man. I appreciate all the work you're doing, man. And I can't wait for the more, more of your work and just more of your work on the Scott Horton show and anti-war radio. It's excellent. Everyone go check out Scott's work. I'll be all the descriptions and whatnot are going to be in the description link below. Scott, man, thanks for your time. Thank you for having me, Henry. It's been great talking, man.